Guess what, friends? It's another one of these episodes. Ladies and gentlemen, for Westchester Flight 1515 to Calgary at gate 27. I'm in an airport. We're for a hairy gasmo. So you know that that means it's another travel episode. Kathleen Marie. We're going to uh, L.A. for hopefully a bunch of PR and promo stuff. We'll see if it happens. I hope you can hear me over this announcement. The way. Um, that's what's going on. I'm gonna talk to. I'm hanging out with Vincent Diamante. Maybe I'm gonna talk to some other people. We'll see how it goes. Bye forever. And Stella Hawkins, party of three. Once again, if you're in your name, please make your way to gate 27 for passport verification. Hello. It's me, Brandon Sheffield. I'm here at the Angel Brewery in the Arts District of Los Angeles, California, having just been uh, essentially kicked out of the mix venue. The, the mix was supposed to happen, the Media Indie Exchange. That's the whole reason I flew down here. Uh, it was going to be, you know, a big media event, and a lot of people are going to come and play the games. But then it got shut down because apparently the venue didn't have permits and the fire department came and it got the whole thing got closed down. Everybody had to leave. And then I tried to find another place and um, that place turned out to be... It was in the Bradbury building. And then that place turned out to be, uh, what do you call it? Members only. So that sucked. Now here we are. It's me and Vince Diamante. We're trying to do some podcast content. It's very sad. He was—he drove me. He drove up here from Orange County, picked me up at the airport, and we were trying to do it, but it all fell apart. So now we're going to do some other podcast content, and we're going to talk about treasure. So, wait a minute! You already talked about that. That's right, but you have some other things to talk about. You—you uh, you, ha- you said we missed an overarching point. What was that? Uh, I think oh, wait, wait. First, before I get to that, I just want to point out how many times Vincent Diamante came up in our podcast about Treasure for having been able to play the games very successfully. And uh, I think that's quite fun. So what, what were you going to say, Vin? What is there to say? Uh, first off, uh, a quick correction. It's uh, something Tim mentioned uh, because, uh, you know, Sakimoto scoring some of those schmups like uh, Radiant Silver Gun and Gradius V. Yep, he definitely did those. He did not do Ikaruga, which was all Hiroshi Uchi, because he wanted to do everything in that game. And mostly successfully, and because of that, that. yeah, because of that, I honestly don't think it's that great a game. You know, I I agree with the panel there that it's incredibly overrated. It's a perfectly okay average game. Yeah, I mean, realistically, we don't hate any of those games on there. Like, I'd, I'd rather play Ikaruga than a lot of other games. However, if we're talking about ranking them, it's, it's, it's in, the lower, in the lower part, I would say. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the things that makes Ikaruga not great is that the story kind of sucks. I do have this feeling that is something I was wondering if you guys were going to get to, but I feel that it was glossed over, which is that Stories tend to be really important, or at least connected, to the quality of the gameplay that's in all these treasure games. I personally feel, and I wish I had seen a little bit more in some of the discourse that's on the internet, but a lot of the really good games that Treasure has come out with, yeah, they have great mechanics, but I think that a lot of those are motivated by some very interesting or at least uh, somewhat thought-provoking narratives that are there. Like, like, like Silhouette Mirage. There is actually an interesting story behind it, um, or at least one that gives you questions about uh, what is the nature of the world. It's sort of this not just post-apocalyptic, but also really futile world. And there's something very interesting in the connection between this absurd mechanic that works really well and the the futility of this act that's supposed to wrap the world all together after the post-apocalypse sort of 
you know, turns everything into these two types of entities and then you're trying to bring everything else back together. There's a utility to that that I think is really interesting when you connect it with the, with the sheer absurdity but also the elegance of what you, the player, is doing. Uh, like, I think a lot of other treasure games have that. Maybe it's not really a connection there, but there is a narrative elegance and rhythm or rhyme to the narrative that fits with everything that's going on in the mechanics of the game that tries to sort of glue everything a little bit better together. And it doesn't really seem like that much, especially since so many treasure games are so good mechanically. But that little bit, I think, is present in all the very best treasure games at the top of the list and not at the ones at the bottom. Yeah, I think I, I see what you're saying. I feel that why we didn't talk about that stuff is because I don't think any of us feel that they integrate them successfully enough. I think that you really have to like dig and find that story stuff that's there. I mean, because it is there, but you have to really think about it. It's not obvious, and the way they do it is not clean or well integrated into the game. I understand, though, that, that there is, like, they do have, they try to connect them thematically, but not, like, mechanically. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. Uh, but it also points to where Treasure came from. Like, there are people that designed games back in the early 90s, where things could be connected just in that thematic way. You didn't have to have the story actually integrated into the game for you to experience it. Yeah. And that's sort of... Uh, that was the way it was for so many games, where the story was the thing that you consume elsewhere, outside of the game, or in a book, or, or whatever. Uh, yeah. But uh, I think that little bit does help when it comes to getting in the mindset of how you play the game. That's part of how you find the fun, because so much of good treasure games is actually being able to find the fun. Yeah. And uh, the story kind of helps you with that. Like, uh, I think one of the things that got me into Radiant Silver Gun actually was because I really enjoyed the story of that game. And it's kind of silly thinking about that considering that's a that's a vertical shooter. <laughs> but um, the way that they actually do a pretty good job of consistently and elegantly creating this game world that exists at the end of the world. You know that the world is over. And that context, I think, helps a lot with getting you into the mindset of what the hell are you supposed to do while playing this game? You know, the sort of ridiculous absurdity of the puzzle that's presented to you there actually fits there as opposed to a normal type of those, those, context. Those you people know? down there really agreed with you. I just wanted to point out, if, if you all heard there were a bunch of people cheered, they were obviously cheering for that. So, okay, keep going. Yeah, yeah, it's it, as, a, as a different type of shooter, like a, a more typical narrative of, yeah, you're the hero, you have a humanity that's there to save. Yeah. Or you are there to, to destroy someone and that will create some meaningful consequence on the other end. You know, that's very different. Um, the fact that you are doing, uh, that you're being asked to go through these sort of absurd machinations and they result in something that is meaningful in a totally different way I think connects with the overall absurdity of, yes, I'm fighting for my life when there's no more life out there for me to actually live after I, you know, outside of uh, the game that is presented narratively there. It's interesting because I think they do present a good premise or a good spark of an idea. And then it doesn't like, it can encourage you to be more interested, but it doesn't necessarily actually integrate with the game and get you all the way there. Another friend is arriving, so we have to pause. We'll, we'll get back to talking about some things later. Uh, bye forever. Hello. We're back. We're driving around Seal Beach, Long Beach. Where are we going exactly? What, what's the town? Fountain Valley. Oh yeah, Fountain Valley. We are going to Echo Tech, which is a book-off branch, I guess, um, that has a lot more electronics and things. And I noticed, actually, that they, um, 
on their window decal they had they had TVs and they had cameras and stuff, but they had the 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 icons flipped for them. So uh, it's a bit of a slapdash affair. But anyway, that's where we're going now. Um, last night we had a few press people come by the bar where we were hanging out in order to try to salvage the situation of the uh, event that I was that I came to Los Angeles for disintegrating. I'm still kind of um, processing <laughs> that that occurred because we, I didn't fully get into it, but we were like, we were standing there. We had set up our stuff, rewinding even further. Before my flight to LA from Oakland airport, the flight announcer was like, okay, everyone flying down to LAX, your flight will begin boarding in about 10 minutes. And then the power went out in the airport. And it was just like, maybe it's destiny, not supposed to go. Um, but the, it wound up getting resolved. The power came back on after some time, and we were able to fly. Vince had to spend many hours picking me up, driving around, because there were various problems at the airport. But then we got to the the mix event, and we had... A location, but this other person was like, I was supposed to be doing three games. They were all supposed to be together, but they're not. So could you move to another area? So we did. Then we moved our whole setup and got it all set back up. Did a bunch of fiddly stuff with resolutions and whatever. And then came the announcement from the from the organizer with a mic that everything was shut down and the fire department was here and the venue was getting closed possibly forever. It was just like, all right, I guess that's what we're doing. So I tried to go to another place to try to salvage it and get like Kotaku and other people to come. And uh, then it turned out that that place that I chose was members only and we couldn't go there. So I just went to some other random bar, but by then it was too late. I was able to get Nintendo Life and Push Square. So big thanks to them for actually coming. But... It was so uh, slapdash and dumb, and that that was the is leading up to where we stopped talking last time. Uh, Vince and I were talking about treasure, and then one of my friends showed up, and then right after that, uh, Push Square and Nintendo Life arrived, and I was able to demo the game. That's the whole story. That's everything that happened. Hopefully, that's interesting to somebody. <laughs> it was a weird kind of situation but now we're going to go down there and uh look at some electronics maybe we'll see some stool cool stuff not some stool stuff and, uh, that's not what i want to see <laughs> um and we'll tell you what we find but in the meantime i wanted to talk to vince about something because he kept coming up in this podcast the last podcast the treasure one and sometimes other times for finishing these games that don't really work for some other people's brains like Radiant Silver Gun, Bong Gaio, which was a tough one for me and Tim to wrap our brains around, and especially Resonance of Fate. We've talked about that a little bit, I think, even on the show, but Resonance of Fate is one of those games made by um, Triace, right? Yeah, Triace. Published by Sega. I liked the art of it and everything. Cool 360 RPG. But I was only able to play that game until they force you to engage with the battle system hundred percent because I never understood it and all the reviews I read were like it was cool until I had to actually do all the things they wanted me to do in the battle system because I could never get it but you were able to get it so anyway how does your brain work (laughs) wait does it work I I think that's debatable honestly um I don't know it's I, I think that yeah there's definitely a whole era of games out there um and and, you know i guess with the mid and late 90s where people and developers were really trying to play against expectations in different ways right simple things for example like side barrier you know there's a cool shmup but uh, that idea of no you do want to be close to the things that are actually really harmful to you that will kill you the scraping yeah the scraping and like they turned that into a mechanic and i think because stuff like that is so direct that might be easier to grok for a lot of people but then there are times when you play against the trope 
but you do it in a way that's perhaps a little nuanced or a little obtuse. And then it becomes tough to really figure out or to easily or succinctly convey. Like Resonance of Fate. Yeah. Hit points don't matter. Like, they never actually say that in the game, but hit points don't matter. Like, there's so many things that really don't matter. Damage doesn't matter. Um, the, the actual attack power of your weapons does not matter. So many of the hallmarks of role-playing games totally meaningless in favor of things like the resonance points that you build up or the scrape that you can actually create with your uh, weapons uh, when you're incurring damage that doesn't actually dam damage the enemy. Yeah, I think that was one of my big problems with it is that they tutorialized things very normally and then at a certain point it's like, well, actually you're supposed to be doing this thing where you're like, zipping back and forth and getting on top of them and go do it shooting while you're upside down and stuff and it's like I don't I never knew how to do any of this and it wasn't really it wasn't really well explained and so how how was it that you unraveled it uh it or if you want to explain what the system is to people so that they can sort of understand it too oh man it's if you can remember honestly it was such a natural system because you just sort of flip things around a lot of games, what they do when they when they introduce new systems or new mechanics, it will be, oh, it's mostly this thing that you're familiar with, and here's some extra stuff that you could throw in every now and then, and the extra stuff is this 10%. In Resonance of Fate, you're primarily dealing with all the crazy stuff and the things that you want to do 10% of and yet are also really, really important are things like walking. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, positioning yourself just by normally walking is actually a really important thing to do in the second half of the game when you're doing advanced battle tactics. <laughs> in the beginning of the game, you're just like, oh, I, you really should be just engaging with this primary thing by doing these triangular, you know, resonance attacks all the time because it's just a balance of building up points, using those points, and killing enemies. And it's really just that. Without ever thinking about hit points, either your own hit points or enemy hit points, you're just thinking about managing resonance points. You're building them, you're using them to attack, and killing them, and that's it. And then later on in the game, you deal with the finer things. Like, oh, I actually have to move my character behind a wall or behind a barrier and fire from cover or, or, you know, and those things sound absolutely normal, but it, it, and you're right. The game does a really bad job of tutorializing it, especially since they actually have a long tutorial at the very beginning of the game. I think it's something like 20 different tutorials, just telling you all about these basics, but they introduce them to you in the wrong way. Yeah. It's it. So I think what I'm kind of gleaning is that, I think you're more willing to engage in the weird systems or the like the unusual possibilities like from from the start if they're available. For me, if I don't have to engage with something that I can't immediately figure out, I won't do it. I'll just leave it alone. And I think that's where a lot of like reviewers of Resonance of Fate got tripped up because they had the same path as me where it's like you don't actually have to do all the triangle attacks and stuff for the first third of the game or so. And then eventually, once it's like, oh, you can't do damage without them, then you have to figure it out. But by that time, you've been playing the game a different way for 10, 12 hours. And, and that's, that's the point that I got into. But if you're like interested in engaging with those systems and figuring them out sooner, then I guess... By the time you get there, you're like, I've been doing this all along. Something like that. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think also that my own upbringing as a pianist had some effect on that. Where, you know, the importance of not just playing a work, but interpreting a work is really important at a high level. You know, you, you know when you're in elementary school, when you're 10, 12 years old... Uh, you know, you're really just trying to see if you can 
play through Beethoven or Chopin or whatever piano piece. You know, I'm a pianist. But then after a certain point, you go through a work and you think, is there a right way to do this? Is there a best way to do this? And is there my way to do this that's worth conveying to the rest of the world? Um, so when I look at a game, there's definitely a part of my brain that thinks, okay, what can I do to actually get through this game? And then there's a really significant part of the brain, perhaps more significant, larger, that's just thinking, can I make this game my game even before I start actually engaging with the game? And I, I spent a lot of time just thinking, oh, what really are the systems here? What is it that I really want to do with this? And I'll ask myself those questions just as loudly or even more loudly than I ask the game itself what it wants me ostensibly to do. I wonder if that's the perspective that super play type people like Sunhi Legend or whatever come at a game from when they're the the ultimate goal for some of these people is to create like wacky combos that somebody else wouldn't have thought of or people that are like I'm going to make the weird penis rocket in uh <laughs> in Zelda Tears of the Kingdom or whatever are, are these people thinking about how to make the game their own from the start because I'm I'm certainly never thinking that I'm like uh bring me on a journey and if you're not going to take me there I'm not going to go so that's it's that's interesting to hear that in the kind of game that I wouldn't expect it like a JRPG where the story is definitely it's mapped out for you there's, there's no way you can make the story your own there but you can make the the play of it your own to some extent I guess yeah I I think that there are some players out there it makes me think actually of like fighting game players especially combo guys yeah you know there's definitely a little bit of a different approach to the game when you're talking about fighting game players that are just competing for tournaments and you know going to uh, you know going to your weeklies and just want to to rock it there just whether it be like a, a ranking battle type thing or some uh, other tourney and then there's the combo fiends yeah that look at the game and are thinking oh this is a space for me to express myself yeah uh, and then they put some like uh, new metal track over it, and then they put it on YouTube. That's what they used to do in the early 2000s. <laughs> yeah, it, it was really fun. That I mean, guys were doing that on. I mean, there were, I knew some guys that actually just did that on VHS. Uh huh. You know, they wow. used the school Amiga computers and like, hey, yeah, let's let's do something with with Street Fighter, and let's do something with uh with uh, Samurai Showdown because I had a, a friend in high school who actually had a Neo Geo. Dang. Yeah, I had one friend in high school who had a Neo Geo, and I was like, "Wow, I guess this guy's rich." <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, yeah that, Wait, no, that was in uh, in middle school. I had a friend. Oh wow, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That those guys, if you had a Neo Geo, you know that they were um, they had some really hot stuff happening there. And, yeah. Uh, uh, gosh, three hundred dollar cartridges. I mean, three hundred dollars in in early nineties money. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, they're back up to that price basically again now. <laughs> Well, we're about to arrive here at our destination, so we'll pick back up after we find some fun stuff. And we'll talk to you again soon. Except, bye forever. Okay, we are back. We went to Echo Tech, and it was all right. We didn't get there very much. We saw some cool stuff. There were about five different... Um, connects Xbox connects there was a 360 several 361s one in box there was a Xbox one connect all kinds in there those were in the jack pile sorry to them there was a DVHS player which which Vince found that was really neat how many how many DVHS tapes commercially got made I, I remember I looked it up at some point and I thought it was like five I, I wanted to say a dozen but yeah, not very many, but there are out there. Like, I want to say things like Jurassic Park or yeah. Speed or things like that. Yeah, really mainstream stuff. But uh, it was four hundred dollars, so I didn't buy it. Um, but it'd be cool to have a DVHS deck. Not that I would ever get a DVHS tape, but you know, these things could happen. I saw one once in a thrift store. 
a, a tape. Oh wow! Yeah, um, but it was something like Speed or Jurassic Park, and I was like, huh, I don't, I don't need this. <laughs> this isn't something I need. Um, we also we saw some other cool things. What else did we see that was neat? Um, aside, well, you can talk about the thing that you bought. Yeah, um, they had a lot of CD players, DVD players, Blu-ray players. I decided to actually buy this one Sony Blu-ray player specifically because there is a way to rip Super Audio CDs. And Super Audio CDs are these kind of weird, high-definition uh, CDs that actually store audio in a weird way. It's like one-bit Delta Sigma, but it's super high resolution, like 2.8 megahertz resolution. And just a very different way of storing audio. And in Japan, that format actually survived for a while, especially in the classical and jazz circles. So hopefully I can get this Blu-ray player set up and then I'll throw in my my T-Square selection. Uh, yeah. I have a big collection of T-Square Super Audio CDs that I want to try ripping to my computer just over the network. If that is a success, I will be very, very happy. Did you get those T-Square CDs at Bunkado? Uh, no, actually, I got these ones. These were more recent. Uh, they were released in the last few years uh, in Japan. Oh, yeah. And I decided to grab them the last time I was there, or, uh, yeah, right around New Year's this year. That's pretty cool. Uh, Bunkado, by the way, is a secret place that I guess I'll let you know about um, in, <laughs> in Little Tokyo. We got all the stuff we want. Yeah, we got pretty much everything that we want from there. It's a place that over the many years we have been going because upstairs in Kodo, they have uh, cassettes and CDs and laser discs that are all at rock bottom prices. So cassettes are a dollar, CDs are three bucks, laser discs used to be five bucks, but then they put it up to 75% of the listing price and the listing price is often like between 60 and 75 dollars but it's still pretty decent once you get down to it and they're they're brand new all of these things by the way are brand new the cds the cassettes so i bought i mean all i cleaned out the city pop selection obviously not just me but other other people did as well i got a bunch more cds this time but there were a bunch of t-square which is a uh, excellent japanese jazz fusion light jazz ish in the middle of that band and uh, I, I only got one from there, but Vince got a whole bunch last time. Because last time I was there, I was in a rush, and I didn't have the real opportunity to browse. Now most of the cassettes are Enka. Most of the CDs are, I don't know, stuff that we already have or other things. But it was it was like this perfect, this perfect time capsule because all these CDs were purchased between, uh, in like from Japan in bulk to come here it, between like 1986 and 1993 something like that they have a few stragglers on either end but yeah i mean well definitely with the laser discs you know that they were still doing that stuff in the mid and late 90s like up to 97 98 yeah but yeah as far as i know they stopped actually getting new stock around 99 2000 which Funny enough, is actually the first year that I discovered that place, you know, going to school in Los Angeles at 1999. Uh, so that place has been a time capsule the entire time that I've known it in the you know, 24 years. And it's it's actually been very secret. Not too many people have known it. We just sort of know that, you know, every now and then you might want to go back and get a little bit of a nostalgia kick or discover something that you want to discover you want to just jump into and see what this thing is like yeah i i actually didn't know about the upstairs until like six or seven years ago <laughs> so what? yeah i i didn't like sometimes you guys would talk about going and and then i i went there and i was like i don't see what the big deal is because <laughs> i didn't know about the upstairs because I, there was a quite a, a long time where it it looks like you weren't allowed to go up there and so I just I just didn't know. But then once I found out about it, I bought a heck ton of stuff. But also, for a long time, they were trying to sell that stuff at the prices that were listed. For for a really long time, they were trying to actually sell it at the real price. And and I think I got there just like a couple years after they put it all down to rock bottom. So I didn't didn't miss too much. But yeah, 
Yeah, that, that's too bad that you that you didn't realize that earlier. I actually had found out about it because this dude at USC, this this very quiet, mild mannered dude who used to be the president of the USC Anime Club, good old Chad, and he told us all about that place. And uh, we decided, okay, yeah, every now and then we would check it out, maybe get something like a, a CD or maybe even a Laserdisc if we were so daring back in our our college budgets back in the day. Yeah, because back then it was like, I mean, that was just about af- right when they stopped getting new stocks. So it was, it was all still basically new at that time. Very amazing. Anyway, we then, coming back to the present, we, after Echotech, uh, I feel like there was some other cool stuff we saw there, but um, oh, I, <laughs> I guess one was that they spelled retro game, uh, retolo game, which I liked very much. Then we went to a uh, book off, and I bought Cooking Fighter for PlayStation One. That's a Nipponichi game from 1998 about it's like a cooking RPG kind of thing. And uh, we were sad to discover that they had no more. Japanese books. So Book Off, as you may know, is a Japanese chain of used book, CD, game, etc. stuff. And Echotech is a like a offshoot of that. It's almost as though so there's they've got Echo Town and Echotech, and it's almost like they took a Book Off Super Bazaar, which is basically a book off but for everything. So it's got electronics, um, which is usually in a hard off, is as it's called. Uh, but they have them in, in Book Off Super Bazaars. And then they'll have, like, clothes and jewelry and uh, camping goods and stuff. Ecotown in the U.S. is all the stuff except the electronics and the games. And then all the electronics and the games are in the Echo Town. But Book Off itself is mostly book and media-based. So they have books, CDs, records, Laserdiscs, games, DVDs, Blu-rays. But... All their Japanese books they got rid of in March, and that's it's it's very sad. Yeah, really sad because even though this Echo Town and Echo Tech stuff that's pretty recent, Book Off has been around in California for decades. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I have very fond memories of going to the Gardena Book Off, which is still around, and from my understanding, as of this moment, still pretty cool. Uh, because they have a pretty diverse selection of stuff, especially Japanese goods, Japanese literature, Japanese books, Japanese media. Uh, that was a really cool place. I'm hoping that that remains the case after we check it out later this weekend. But yeah, Book yeah. Off has been a fixture in my mind for decades. Yeah, the first time I was aware of Book Off being in the United States is when I went to Hawaii. And Hawaii was such a weird experience for me because it was just full of Japanese people and Japanese stores and things. And like the way people talked about it when I was, when we were in college, I heard somebody walking down the street being like, you know, when he gets back to the U S from Hawaii, he's gonna blah, 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 blah. (laughs) It really stuck in my mind because those people didn't think that the U S that Hawaii was the United States, which is, I mean, it shouldn't be. We should. We shouldn't have. We shouldn't have annexed it. But um, you know, it's, it's a little late for that now. Uh, but yeah, the book offs out here in Southern California have been really cool for a long time, and we can only hope that the Gardena one still has some business going. We're we're on the driving down the Pacific Coast Highway right now. There's sand dunes on the left, um, some sort of a weird track on the right that looks like. It's used for some industrial something or other. It's a weird vibe. It feels strange being back in this area. We're some pretty good hiking over here. Like, yeah, not all the wetlands have been turned into military areas. There's uh, some good parks and, and wetland areas where you could just hike uh, and, you know, check out some birds. It's very popular for bird watching and, you know, bird photography. Delightful. Get you some sandpiper action. I love those sandpipers. They're so goofy looking. Oh, there goes a um, cormorant. Was that a cormorant? I missed that. There's birds. I just saw one. So I guess that's it for us for right now. I have to go drive off to Giant Bomb 
I'm, a, I'm getting on a live stream. This is like the last remnant of the press plans that I had for this whole experience. By the way, check out the new Demon School uh, trailers that are up. By the time you read this, there should, I mean, listen to this. Wow. I guess you could read it if you have an auto transcription thing on. But anyway, by the time you listen to this, there should be two new trailers you can check out. And uh, that's what I was hoping to be thumping out here, but I'm thumping nothing. Anywho, that's it for us for the time being. Driving by these wetlands. Bye forever. Hello again, we're back in the car. I went to my giant bomb stream last night. It was fine. I didn't get to talk about Demon School as much as I would have liked. There were six of us there. But one funny thing that happened was they were asking, Jeff Grubb was asking about everyone's experience at Summer Game Fest. So I asked how many E3s people had been to because uh, I started going in 1999 and the lady who was sitting next to me who used to be at Giant Bomb laughed and then was like, wait, you're serious? <laughs> Um, yes, I have gone to E3 since 1999. Uh, maybe it's possible she didn't realize that I'm that old. But, um, anyway, I also talked to Victor Lucas, which was interesting. The non-Tommy Tallarico half of uh, Electric Playground. And, um, he's still out there in Vancouver doing it. And I guess they can't, like, get on broadcast anymore because broadcast television is in a weird space where they're they're worried about video games cannibalizing what remains of their audience for screen time and so they <laughs> don't want to promote it um but also you know they want someone younger and hipper or whatever just all kinds of interesting stuff i wish i had gotten him on on the show and i totally forgot that i had my recorder in my pocket and i didn't do it but anywho in order to get to all those places, I was driving Vince's Mazda Miata, which we're in right now, and I got to drive, and it was pretty, it was interesting. I, so I liked it, Vince, a lot more than your last car that I drove, which was a Mazda 6, and, Mazda 3, oh right, a Mazda 3. Yeah. For some reason, like, the, the closeness of the gearbox felt more wrong in that car. Yeah. To me. And because I drive a Honda Prelude and bo these are all manual cars that we're discussing right now. And in the in the Prelude, the gears are all pretty far apart. But in basically all modern cars, they're very close together. But in the Miata, perhaps because the Miata itself is smaller, it felt it felt appropriate. And it it really just felt like where driving the Mazda 3 made me I was actually uncomfortable driving it. I just, I just felt like a fish out of water in that car. Yeah. Um, this one, it really just felt like, oh, I'm just driving a car. Except it's a much better, faster car. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that Mazda 3 is such a compromised vehicle because it kind of has sporty looks. You know, it's it kind of looks like a hot hatchback, except it's not. The transmission is not quite right for it. It, it actually kind of feels good to move around, but it, it feels like, yeah, the, the gear ratios are just not quite right for some reason. Uh, probably because they, I don't think they made it actually specifically for that car. <sighs> yeah, I mean, this is just a better car. I mean, never mind the fact that it's a, um, you know, a, ostensibly a sports car. It's just not a compromised car in the way that that Mazda 3 was. Yeah, and I guess that's why it kind of, it felt very familiar when, from driving a 98 prelude to driving this what is it 2022 yeah it's a 2022 miata like the gearbox it all feels good to me and when we were at that i think you were there we were at a car show in la some years ago i was sitting in any in every manual automobile and just shifting around to see what it felt like yeah. and of all the cars that i sat in like as someone who is very used to the Prelude and how the Hondas work, I preferred the Miata. And obviously, these are stationary cars in a 
in a showroom, but yeah, I, the I, I prefer, LA Convention Center, right? yeah, the LA Convention Center. I preferred the Miata over the new Civic, mm-hmm. um, just sitting in a stationary car, but then driving it, I was like, yeah, this, it just feels, it feels right. And so some things that I like about this car, it does have a screen, but it's not a touch screen and it has a lot of physical dials and things. So like the, the speedometer and the RPMs are all analog dials. They're not readouts. All of the climate adjustment stuff is physical dials. And the maneuvering of the sound system is all physical stuff. And everything's right where it feels like it should be to me. And uh, that's a problem that I've had with a lot of modern cars is that so much of it is just digital readouts. I don't trust it. (laughs) And that... I don't feel confident that it's actually doing what it says. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. I mean, way too many cars that I otherwise like are just really messed up by having touchscreen for everything or digital for everything or overloaded controls where button might have different states and will actually do different things depending on uh, what part of the system that you're in, which is ridiculous. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I really wanted a modern car and that's why I got a brand new car, but I also wanted it to be just have things that are actually unambiguous. Yeah. And that's totally what it is. And so like another thing I enjoyed is there is resistance on the wheel. So many modern cars, when you turn the wheel, the way that their power steering works, it's such that it feels like. It feels like you're on a cloud. It feels like nothing. You can just turn the wheel instantly and you can you can move, in my opinion, too fast. I, do, I feel uncomfortable when the road is not resisting me in the steering. And I like that this does have that kind of pushback when you're turning, when you're maneuvering. And it's still way more sensitive and responsive than, of course, my 25-year-old car. But it still has that element of resistance, which uh, I've realized I really need yeah. in a car. I mean, road feedback is really important, and it does feel like pretty much all the modern cars, in my opinion, they range from somewhere between totally numb to slightly less numb. You know, so like, like Toyotas, a lot of your modern Toyotas are just totally numb, and uh, modern Hondas are better. But they're only a little bit better, which is really frustrating to me. I mean, I grew up on uh, a couple of different cars from the 80s. I had a 1981 Volvo station wagon, which was huge. It was a brick. It it was amazing, and I loved it. Um, But also besides that, I had a 1984 Honda Civic, which didn't have air conditioning and didn't have power steering. (laughs) So that was actually kind of fun, but I also really learned to appreciate what it meant to have uh, the road just tell me exactly what's going on there. And ever since that point, it's just been downhill. I mean, this is, I mean, it's a modern car. It has power steering. There's electrical assistance happening there. But at least I still know what's going on underneath the wheels. And it's so hard to find something these days that actually does that, unless it's a sports car, basically. Yeah, I I guess I'm connecting that that's probably where I got it from, too, because I was always driving older cars or when I was buying cars with intention, like I had a Slant 6 Dodge Dart and that didn't have power steering. And and I like I really knew what the road was doing because I had to, you know, you aim those cars more than you steer them. And uh, I mean, less of that than my later 68 Pontiac Tempest, which was very, uh, very aim oriented, even though that did have power steering, it was still like, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go there. (laughs) It's what the car would tell me. But yeah, I I like that. One one thing that was odd to me, not odd, it's, it's like, there's some elements of it that are too good. Usually I would say in a bad way, not in a bad way in this case, like it's too easy to go fast. And I think part of that is that I'm used to a lowered car, so my, my prelude is, is lowered. I raised it up a little bit, so it's only like three inches off the ground. It used to be like two. It was just, or, No, it was, it was three, now it's four. But anyway, 
as as listeners may know, the lower your car, the faster it feels like you're going. Because if you if you're watching the road, the road is appearing to come toward you faster when your car is lower. And then when you if you go f- from a sedan to an SUV, you'll notice this. You'll you're you're when you're higher up, it feels like you're not going as fast as you may be. And so you can suddenly be going 80 miles an hour without realizing that that's happening. Um, obviously, I adjusted pretty quickly to realizing what my speed was, but I just uh, realized how how easy it was to go too fast. <laughs> this was kind of fun. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, you know, for as much as this is a sports car, it's, it's, it's a roadster. It's not really made to go fast. It's kind of made to... Uh, you know, be at least somewhat relaxed, somewhat modern. And um, <laughs> honestly, when you were talking about the road whipping past, my first thought was, oh, this is why you're a PC Engine guy, because so many of those games are all about what can we do with parallax scrolling in order to really create a good sensation there. Yeah, they love to go fast. They love to just, like, blast things at you. Uh, yeah, it probably all comes together in some way. Uh, one thing that was a little more difficult for me, and I understand why it's this way, but I, it would take a lot more getting used to. It was true of your last car as well, but the the reverse being way over on the left is is hard for me. So you push the stick down and move way over to the left and up in order to go into reverse. And that's, I think it's good that it's like way outside the regular gearbox so that you don't, there's no ambiguity about it. But it makes parallel parking and, and like when you have to do a three-point turn harder for me to visualize because now reverse and first are right next to each other and I have to pop out of reverse to get into first, but I'm still in the same sphere. I'm in the same zone. Yeah. So that's a real like mental gymnastics thing for me when I was doing that. Yeah, I feel like all the manual cars I've had, it's just been a little bit different for all those reverse lockouts. Yeah, and for me, all all of my manual cars have had the exact same configuration, which is first, all the way. first, first is top left, and then reverse is all the way bottom right. Yeah. Um, but this uh, this this, yeah. this car also has six gears, uh, which is not I'm used I'm used to five, yeah. and um, this this car also suggests to you what gear you might want to be in. It's got a little thingy that tells you about that. And uh, I do wish that I could turn that off. Uh, I want to turn that off. I'm trying. I feel like I read it in a manual somewhere. What to do to turn it off, and then I just keep on forgetting actually to do it. So I I need to figure that out. I've yeah. had this thing for already half a year now. Oh, and uh, speaking of how long you've had it, I while I was in the car, I actually took a photo of it. I was able to, I turned the car over to 6666 while I was driving. Darn it. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, sorry, Vince. You missed it. I missed it. But I got, I took a photo of it. So you can, you can pretend, but I felt a little guilty that I was, I was taking all the sixes. But yeah, the, the thing that I, I don't really mind that it suggests what gear I could be in too much, but what really kind of bugged me was that this is a, a, di- a little digital readout and it, tells it reminds you what gear you're currently in which i kind of don't like that but it's also not one-to-one with when you've done it like it, it lags behind a little bit and and that for whatever reason it bugs me because it's, it's like a number i feel like i need to look at and then when it's wrong i'm like it just it just irks me a little bit yeah i guess so i i think it helps that it really isn't very bright you know, so there yeah. there is like a digital display here on the left side for things like fuel and your um, your trip meter, and that's actually pretty bright. It sort of feels like it matches the analog gauges, but the gear selection thing uh, that's really quite dim. So I feel like I'm pretty good at just ignoring it, but still it it annoys the heck out of me when I pay attention to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what else did I have to say about this car? It's um, small. And I like that. I, I was able to park in a parking spot that I would not have been able to park in otherwise. So that was that was pretty cool. And but I think just in general, it gave me some confidence in modern cars. Like realistically, 
the Prelude is probably the last combustion engine car that I will own. I'll probably yeah. probably get an electric car the next car that I get. I mean, Honda or Toyota or Hyundai need to make me a nice electric sedan uh, because I think they'll make one, you know? Uh, I mean, Honda has some really cool designs that Unfortunately, they're not showing for the American market because yeah. I think they're just too small for what they think American consumers yeah. will buy. This is like an uh, and Yeah. I, I got this car because I have a similar sentiment to you. I want to have one last combustion car that I will enjoy as a pure internal combustion engine car. Yeah. And then, okay, I'll get an electric car later. You'll, it'll be fine. Uh, but I really do hope that some of the sentiment and feeling behind the design of cars like these will actually go into whatever electric car I get in the future. Yeah. Oh, uh, there, there goes a uh, uh, Nissan 370Z just uh, roaring by. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that way. And I'm not sure. The thing that worries me most about Electric cars is that they're all just like big giant iPad in for for all your gauges and all your everything's digital, and I want I'm hopeful that somebody will make something with a little bit of some analog biz in it. But it, I guess it in some ways it doesn't make sense, but in other ways I think that there's going to be a pushback on the the general Tesla design. I feel like everyone's kind of copying that right now and maybe now that everybody hates me uh elon musk finally um we'll, we'll move away from it a little bit we'll see but yeah they they, they got to make one they got to make one for me if they want me to buy one also i need to be able to afford it <laughs> that's that's a critical factor um yeah hopefully with it being mainstream and uh you know economies of scale and all that yeah that's what i'm hoping well it's been fun driving this car talking about this car hopefully you all enjoyed hearing about it because you all liked hearing about car talk back in the uh tokyo game show episode we're now going to another book off before we head off to veggie paradise which is a great vegetarian chinese taiwanese restaurant out there in uh, san gabriel san gabriel my, my brain was, i was i was about to say Reseda. it's not in it's, uh, that's, uh, that's a different direction much different direction than uh San Gabriel. And we'll tell you what we got at Book Off, and we'll talk about some other things after that. So, bye forever. Okay, so we're in the, the Book Off. They got a lot more stuff. I was marveling at how they still have a huge Otome game collection for PSP. And we found some interesting things. There's a East 1 and 2 and 7 box set for PSP, which I didn't know existed. And then Vince kind of one up to me there by finding the, what was it? Oh, it's a combo, combo package of Ace Combat 6 and beautiful Katamari. <laughs> it's like not something you would expect to exist. I'm a little tempted to get this. East one and two and seven set just because it's neat. It's 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 fifty bucks. It's not the worst. Yeah. Um, box looks cool. Box looks cool. I'm just gonna hold on to it. Yeah, there's they they got more Mega Drive stuff here. Oh, we, I guess the real test is gonna be, do they still? Yes, they do still have Japanese literature here, which is what we were missing from the last place. So that's good to see. Yeah, this place hasn't changed that much. From no. my first experiences with this, close to two decades ago. And they actually still have some, they got some Mega Drive games, which most, most of these book offs in the area are 100% like all Nintendo, Nintendo all and a little Sony. Oh, they have Gunpei R, which I actually don't own. Oh, Look at hey. that. Yeah, I don't have Gunpei R. And uh, I never noticed this cover, which is just like a stylish 2000s Japanese lady, <laughs> like photo cover. Very interesting. Well, I'll pick that up. I need to stop buying so many PSP games. Um, I do love the PSP, though. I feel like... Vita games, even. Yeah, I got some Vitas. Nothing that's blowing my mind. We got some more Otome games. Oh, yeah, that's... that's a, it's like a Zero Escape-like. Oh, okay. 
sort of a game, I believe. Yeah, yeah and they've got um, something I haven't seen before, which is Japanese Xbox One games. Yeah. Like, uh, this is, I believe, my first time seeing one. <laughs> Assassin's Creed Origins is, is what we're looking at here. But yeah, they, they got a... They got a lot of neat stuff. We got um, Japanese double clutch. Um, yeah, Sega Golf Club on PS3. Oh, they got the PS3 um, Initial D Extreme Stage. Now, that didn't come out in the US, did it? No, I d I'm pretty sure it didn't. Yeah. Oh, see, now I'm getting tempted. And the silly thing is, buying anything right now is very silly because... You and I are both going to Japan in less than a month. Less than a month. And so <laughs> to be buying Japanese games out here feels foolish. And yet the temptation is strong. You know, there's that thing where you kind of want to support the idea of something like this continuing to exist. And so you just kind of want to buy things to give them the idea that people will buy things. I mean, I if do, that makes I, sense. I do that all the time, honestly. I still want to go over here. There's still things that I get from here. Maybe not so much games, but definitely some of the Japanese literature. And yeah, I'm not a Japanese reader, but uh, I do get a lot of Japanese music books over here, which are really useful for me as a musician. Um, uh, yeah, I love this place. Yeah, and I just picked up, um, I'm not going to buy it, Guilty but... Guilty Gear 2? Guilty Gear 2 Overture, the Japanese version. I've never get, looked at the... some proto-MOBA on you? Yeah, never looked at the box. We, we talk about this a lot on the show, but that's like kind of the first MOBA. Uh, before we knew what a MOBA was, they made this game and everyone was confused about it. Oh, here's the Japanese box, El Shaddai. El Shaddai rules. <laughs> everyone should play El Shaddai. And for me, for whatever reason, the PS3 version is the the definitive one. I think it is. It was the well. Quite often with the the Japanese games of that era, it was the the main oh, target. That's the deception. No, not yeah, we got Kagero. yeah, we got Kagero. Well, I mean, it's 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 yeah. the Deception series. Yeah. Dark Side Princess. What was Katamari Tribute? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember what that is. Well, it's here, and I'm gonna have to look it up and see what it is because I don't actually know. This is the fun of browsing. Uh, you, you just get to see all this stuff that you're like, what exactly is this? What is this thing? Uh, there's a compile heart game. What 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 was this? Mugen Souls. Oh, Mugen oh, Souls. Yeah. That's right. I didn't realize it was compile heart. Well, I could stand here and pull games out and talk to you about them all day. I don't know if that's something... I always get self-conscious about whether that's something people actually want, but then people are always like, please do that for an entire episode. I think that would be easier if there was a, a bigger PC Engine selection over here, but... Yeah. Uh, I do remember that used to be the case. They had some Turbo stuff and some Turbo CDs back in the 2000s, but I don't see any sign of that now. Yeah, it's... Uh... We've lost it. Oh, th so this this game here, Fish On, is by Sims. And that's fun, because Sims is that very Sega... Like, they're almost to Sega what HAL is to Nintendo. They were always doing kind of second-party-ish Sega mm -hmm. stuff, so they did, like... What's it called on the 32X? Um, I'm blanking. They did a shooter on the 32X, then they did a sequel to it on the Saturn... Uh, both of which are cool and a little underrated, and I've talked about them before, and I completely am blanking on them right now. But uh, I'm I'm curious to get this fishing game because it looks so. It's it's a uh, fish on on the 3DS. It looks so Sega <laughs> to me. It's got the yeah. blue skies. It's got the guy getting a getting a bass fish. I don't know if I really yeah. need it, but I mean, fishing you you have to think of Sega when it comes to that, unless you're really old and you're gonna deal with. I don't know, Jalico or something. Yeah, and it's published by ASCII and Kadokawa. I'm, 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 I'm tempted, I'm tempted. I can now get uh, Japanese 3DS games because I have a Japanese 3DS. Um, so, I mean, of course I could pirate them as people love to shriek at me whenever I talk about buying these games legitimately. Yeah, that's the easy way to do things. You don't want to do the easy thing when you're playing video games, right? No. You gotta, gotta give yourself a little challenge. 
Or else what do you do? Oh, there's a Terraformars 3D, 3DS oh, game. Oh. Huh. Truly had no idea. I will purchase Terraformars. <laughs> you need a basket. What the heck? Um, maybe I need a basket because we haven't even gotten to the literature yet. Well, okay, I'm going to pause here so that we're not just like, oh, wait, what's... Oh, that's, an, uh, that's also an Otome game. You know, I just... I don't want to have dead air here, but I'm also just like... I'm looking at everything, and I've got... I've got curious things to say about so much stuff. Oh, it's Marsh by Dimple. <laughs> what's, what's that? Marsh by Dimple. Man, there's a Sega game I never heard of on the DS. Oh, Onna Chikara. Women's Power. And it's about it's about doing your makeup and yeah. uh, and keeping your mental state good. Yeah, there's a I think it's a whole section. Yeah. Man. Well, I hope that the Onnas can get their chikara going pretty well. Dektayo Mama. I did it, Mom. Is the name of that one. It's fun to Oh, here's a, here's another one. This is a uh, calorie navi. This is um to give you anxiety about what food you're eating. It shows on the front that you you can eat a hot dog for 364k cows, or you can have hot tea for zero. <laughs> yeah, there's a Genki game that is uh, all about teaching you business manners, business etiquette. Yeah, we're definitely in the other section here, and I'm looking at DS therapy. Um, wow. And I guess it's gonna, it's got a little therapist here who's gonna help you out. Hold on. Wait a minute. Why is Ghost Trick sitting in here? Because it's other. Why is Lost Magic in here? Yeah, well, I think um, some things may have gotten refiled. Yeah. Um, is this like a, and there's, there's a Disney Friends. So yeah, the, the other section has gotten expansive. Okay, I was actually thinking, I like Ghost Trick. Yeah. Maybe I should play it in Japanese, and then I am seeing it's fifty nine ninety nine. That's oh a my bit goodness, much. That's a lot of dollars. That is a bit much. That's too many monies. Yeah, the, the prices are for sure all over the place over here. Sometimes in one's favor, sometimes not in one's favor. And certainly when it comes to Ghost Trick, the answer is not. Yeah. So, all right. Now I'm really going to pause until we get over to the books and we'll talk a little more and we'll see you over there. Bye forever. So I lost Vance. He went over to look at the uh, music books and stuff, but I forgot they got a great selection of soundtrack stuff here. We got like Fantasy Star Online 1 and 2, Taito Station number 5, so it's like old Taito arcade games. This co compilation came out in 1990. It's got Rust and Saga, New Zealand Story, Master of Weapon, Operation Thunderbolt, Sailor Moon. I think this is the Super Nintendo version. They have the soundtrack to it, released in 1995, this game, this soundtrack. Very tempting. They're all very expensive, though, um, unfortunately. With, um, perhaps rightfully so, Persona Compilation CD Box. Oh, man, if they got Shin Megami Tensei 4 in here somehow, that's gonna be... That's gonna be my weakness, and I'm gonna have to buy it. Over in the other section, we did actually wind up finding a few PC Engine games, and, uh some Dreamcast games that were on the other wall. So they still got some some cool stuff out here. There's a Final Fantasy II soundtrack, pretty nice. Okay, I'll let you know when we get back over to the game book zone, see if we find anything exciting. In the meantime, I need to hold myself back from spending too much money. Bye forever. So I found the game guide and fan book section as we listen to this uh, terrible music, um, which feels very appropriate. I mean, you gotta have terrible music in these stores or else it's just not right. At first I thought there wasn't really anything that I was interested in, and then I found there's two Nier books. There's the Nier Automata Strategy Guide and Grimoire Nier Project Gestalt and Replicant System kind of art book and guide which is pretty cool looking so I'm kind of kind of thinking about those I'm just dropping stuff also oh hi Vince hi so I found uh, 
found a couple nears, near books here, which I'm kind of interested in. And then we just got this whole section of, oh, there's some Capcom, but here are the, here are the guidebooks. Did you find anything over in the music section? Uh, there was some cool stuff, and uh, yeah, there was one thing that seemed kind of interesting because it was from the 80s, just talking about jazz chord harmony. And there's a part of me thinking, oh, I could probably make some use out of it, but being entirely in Japanese, I'm not sure if I want to put that much energy into it. It's tough. Yeah, that would be, I think, a bridge too far for me. Um, yeah, other than the near stuff, I'm not really finding a whole lot that I'm wanting. All, all these game guides are either for Final Fantasy or visual novels and stuff. For example, the Otome game Last Escort. Um, there's a surprising amount of Persona stuff in this store. There's Persona Q. There's Persona 3 and 4s up, up there. Not blowing my mind, but I am looking at these nears, dadgummit. Also back there I found um, soundtrack section, which had a lot of good stuff, but it's all priced, unfortunately, quite high. And I get it, but too bad. Okay, well... That's what we got. We'll update you with others. Wait, what is this? Some sort of annex Shitending. I have no idea what this is. It's got interesting art from 1999. Some giant thing about some probably visual novel. Well, we'll see what we get. Talk to you later. Bye forever. All right, so turns out I just wasn't looking hard enough. Uh, we found actually a lot of stuff now. There's a complete collection of drafts about SNK Design Works. It's a SNK, like, bunch of sketch design work stuff. And uh, tell you what, as someone who worked on the Samurai Showdown Neo Geo collection, there's art I haven't seen in here. And I have looked at literally thousands of images of Samurai Showdown. So uh, if you don't get it, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Uh, okay. Also, I'm just looking at this paper. You could tell that it used to be white, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's been around. This has been sitting here for decades. No, you should get this. Are you sure? You're sure? I'm sure. You, because you, you can you're get the guy. It. I mean, you actually, like you said, you actually worked on you can Samurai Showdown. You get it. You should do it. Um, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I also found the complete Rants, and Rants is a an Alice Soft kind of seminal eroge RPG, and it goes through the entire Rants series. And then right next to it, I found Alice no Hanashi four five six. So this is an official guide to the like the second era of Alice Soft. And so it's got like all their early games, including Rants two, uh, 1 through 3, um, Dalk, all these old Alice Soft games, and it has guides to them and illustrated stuff, and it's like, that's actually some history there. Yeah. So. Alice Soft was so, so damn important. I mean, obviously, just in the PC space when it came to developing games, but they influenced everyone. Yeah, they really did. Like, for better or for worse, honestly, they. They did influence everybody. Oh, this is a really ugly looking yeah. Xeno Saga. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of thinking about, you know, right now, Advance Wars just came out. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a lot of influence from Rants on, on Advance Wars. Totally. Um, here's <laughs> first, kiss first, first Kiss Monogatari, which is a originally a PCFX game. And uh, the art, I truly hate it. It's, it's where the, the foreheads were like, five miles long and then they had these big eyes that were like about in the middle of their cheekbones but there's also blue breaker yeah which i do NBC like stuff. which is uh, uh also first on pcfx but first kiss monogatari is interesting because hunex made it and it is the only fighting game on the pcfx because there's a hidden fighting game inside of first kiss monogatari <laughs> um and it's a fighting game from hunex and it's really funny that that exists um, I think I'm also going to get this Blue Breaker, by the way. I'm just loading up on books, god darn. It's, uh, it's, it's getting ridiculous. 
They got Dark Souls 2 design works, which would totally work on me if I uh, wanted that, but luckily, luckily I don't. Yeah, there's, they really got some hot stuff here. I think I'd never looked at this particular section before, but there's some neat things. And it's interesting how, just how much uh, visual novel stuff there is. Like, I don't know if you remember Green Green. We actually covered this on Insert Credit in 2002 or whenever it was. Yeah. And uh, it came out from Groover. It wasn't actually influential or very good, but I just remember that we covered it. I'm Good just still times. reeling over the fact that these things were probably just moving around the shelves of this one store for the last two decades. Absolutely. And here is oh, Desire Desire hey. from Seasware, which has a soundtrack from Ryu uh, Umemoto, yeah. which is amazing. And it's just a bunch of illustrations and stuff. I'm not going to get this one because it's $70, but it is another kind of like Jeez. important series. They also have this East the artwork, uh, or the art book rather, which is a 25th anniversary East book, but I, I just can't, I can't, I can't go that far. It's, it's huge. It's big. It's not too expensive. I just don't. I have to limit what I, what I get <laughs> to things that I feel like are important in some way. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? So, Anyway, that's what we got. You see anything else important that we should talk about before we sign off? I don't know. I mean, over here in this artist section, it seems like they stay pretty modern. Yeah. Uh, but but that section here is just, there's stuff from the 90s and 2000s. And it's just wacky. Oh, yeah. Earlier, I was looking at this Rumble Roses art <laughs> book, and it, it's like so cheesecake, so fan y But like you were saying, Vince, they were... That's what they were talking up, was h how detailed the models could be. Yeah, PS2 Emotion Engine for that uh, for those Rumble Roses characters. Oh my goodness, okay. Here's, here's the last thing we can do before oh we God. sign off. This how is... <laughs> <laughs> Pansu no Kakikata, how to draw panties. How, uh, how to draw the panties. Um, and the publisher is called Niche, and it shows all the directions from which you can draw underwear. I think that's that's the theme of, the, of this particular um, book off trip, I guess. So there you go. That's the it. That's the end. Uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Bye forever. Okay, we have left book off. I've left book off significantly less moneyed than I than I came in because. I wound up buying those art books, and then we found a different part of the game soundtrack section. I had been looking in the in the bins for the game soundtrack stuff, but then there was like a, a separate shelf area. Vince kept finding all the good stuff before me, so while he, he wound up uh, letting me buy the SNK art book, he got the soundtracks for Ridge Racer 6 and Phantom Dust. Extremely jealous. Those are <laughs> very... Very good. I bought every other Ridge Racer soundtrack that was there, but uh, Six was was the one that I have like on eBay alert for when it gets cheaper. But again, we're gonna be in Japan next month, so <laughs> I'll probably be able to find it. But it was a good price. It was uh, it was believe it or not, thirty bucks is a good price for Ridge Racer Six. Like it's on eBay, people are trying to sell it for seventy and up. I don't know if they're succeeding, but that's what they're trying to do. So. Uh, yeah, you got those. What else did you get? Um, not too much. I mean, I did get that Street Fighter II image album. Right. But yeah, Ridge Racer 6 and Phantom Dust, those are the highlights. And that Street Fighter II image album comes with a calendar from like 1993. <laughs> so that's going to be useful when um, uh, during the time loop that we're going to experience. So I wound up buying those art books. I actually wound up putting the the near books back because I was buying I bought Blue Breaker art book for the PCFX I bought that the Rance collection the Rants collection I bought the Alice Soft collection I bought the SNK thing and it was just starting to get and, I, and those soundtracks it started to get wild I also had to put back the East 1 and 2 and 7 box set collection that I found which um, it was actually for a very good price I haven't seen it for sale uh, period. But 
you know, am I going to play East 1 and 2 and 7 in Japanese? Pro probably I'm not. So let's just try to save a little money where we can when we're... It's always that struggle of I see these things and I'm like, this is historically significant. I should buy this so that someone like Frank can preserve it. And then I just get into this swirly zone where it's like, oh, I gotta, gotta do it, gotta buy it. And so uh, it's foolish. I don't know. Whatever. I'm mostly just impressed that, you know, just flipping through that SNK sketchbook, that there were things that you wouldn't see. Yeah, there was stuff in there that after all my gathering of sketches and going to SNK's archives in uh, Osaka, there was stuff in there that I had just never seen before from Samurai Showdown. Yeah, I suspect that it's from when they did this thing where different creators and artists and designers would draw their own interpretation of one character or another so that they could try to get their design through. And I think that's some of what we were seeing in here. But some of it looked like for cutscenes or for other things that didn't happen. Uh, it's pretty neat. So uh, we'll, we'll try to get Frank to scan that thing. It'll probably have to get taken apart, which would be very sad, but it should be preserved for the future if it hasn't been. So that's, that's some neat stuff. Um, and as we're driving around, we're, we're here in Gardena near Torrance and some, uh, long time listeners will know that Vince and I created Insert Credit together back in 2001. But before that, we were both students at USC and we were in an anime club together with a bunch of annoying people. Some of them were nice. I, we still, I, I still talk to some of them. You still talk to more of them. Those people were cool, but we were going around this area specifically a lot in the early 2000s. So Torrance, which is a little south of L.A. proper, used to be like this huge hub of Japanese people from Japan here on Avisa were living and working here, largely because of the auto industry. There was like... Toyota was right next door. Yeah, Toyota was here. Honda was here. Honda still has a museum here. Uh, there was just all this automotive industry stuff that made it actually make sense to have stores that specifically targeted Japanese people, like only Japanese stuff in the store. And so there were three, was it three or four import shops within like two square miles? I think it was three. There was a fourth that we always thought existed, but we couldn't find. It was like another Wanpaku place that didn't really or maybe it was a restaurant but the three stores that we went to were wanpaku hyper game action which was kind of our favorite and game land which was up and down yeah. but i got a lot of stuff at game land i mean i think game land we remember it as up and down because it was the longest lived of yeah. the three and it definitely had a very long tail that was very very down yeah, and toward the end, they just never got new stock from Japan. They just, it, they, they had what they had still. Yeah, but yeah, Game Land was a chain, and they, they had stock from Japan. Same thing with Wanpaku, although Wanpaku died somewhere in the early 2000s, maybe yeah. 2001 or 2002? Yeah, they, Wan, Wanpaku died first, then Hyper Game Action had two, six, two stores, and one of them still exists, but it doesn't sell games. But Hyper Game Action was especially interesting because the guy who ran it... Oh, and I should also mention, so much of the Japanese game industry's U.S. offices were here. Some still are, but, like, the owner of Hyper Game Action would talk to us about, like, oh, yeah, the president of Square Enix was in here the other day asking what kinds of games people are buying and talking to me about what's popular and stuff. And I was like, wow, I guess that it makes sense because in Japan there was such a relationship between publishers and retail, and they would really use that retail response to figure out what was popular, what direction to go next. And so to have like the president of Square Enix US come in and be like, what, what, what games are popular? That may actually have influenced what Square Enix published in the United States somewhat. It's, it's just kind of interesting to think about in those early 2000s there was so there was so much stuff just to look at and browse for 
a nerd who likes <laughs> who likes Japanese things. Yeah. Uh, Everything was just so weird at that time. Uh, like, were the publishers? Uh, you mentioned Square Enix, but they were trying to figure out how to do things because they were SquareSoft, yeah. and then they were Square EA. Right. And then after, and then shortly after that, they were trying to do things on their own. So it makes sense that, uh, well, yeah, we need to figure things out starting on the ground like that. Yeah, and so we would drive down from USC, which is, it's not downtown LA, but it's pretty. It's it's like downtown in between downtown and south central sort of is is what you might say and so we would drive like 45 minutes an hour down to torrance and hit up all the game stores get some milk tea because the milk tea boom really started down in socal with tapioca express and then quickly came along quickly wasn't as good tapioca express one of my favorite things i love i loved this and it was such a mystery to unravel so i went to Tapioca Express in Torrance all the time that like there was this main one on I forget what street it was and the lady there recognized me and liked me and we had a good rapport she was an older uh older Chinese woman and she was like super friendly and would like ask me about how my school was going and we were like buddies but then sometimes I would go in and she would be really cold and really like rude and brusque and abrupt. And I would be like, wow, she's really having an off day. It always really surprised me. And then I went to the Tapioca Express in the Mitsuo marketplace uh, that was also there at that time. And so Mitsuo was a, is a Japanese market in Torrance. They sell Japanese groceries and that whole marketplace was pretty fun because they had like an indoor dining area with curry and udon and it was very much like a japanese shopping center yeah. with only japanese people in it. anyway i went to the tapioca express in there and then she was she was friendly to me and i was like you have another location and she's like oh uh you me and my sister <laughs> we 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 have these two locations and we we swip we swap which one we're in and they're twins they were twins, and one of them liked me, and the other one didn't. Or the other one just didn't care about me, or whatever. But that, that was, like, such a mind-blowing situation, because I was like, why? She used, to, she used to ask me about my day. Why isn't she being nice? And it was just, it was twins. It was twin ladies who looked identical. They were identical twins. Friggin' hilarious. Um, that Meet to a Marketplace was really fun, because you had... There was the so there. I mean, there were all kinds of things on the surrounding areas, and there was actually a game shop there. Wait a minute, that's right. Next to the Mitsuma Marketplace, there was the Japan Video. Right. That was so. That was also a, a, could be considered the fourth game store. It yeah. Was mostly video rental. Again, totally for the Japanese market. And if you wanted to go to the the back third of the store, it was all Japanese porn all the time. But they also had video games there in the front too. Yeah, there were a couple Video Japan locations, and one of them, I remember, I rented PS2 games like Black Matrix 2 and then uh, burned them to play at home. Uh, that Don't tell the cops, please. But the other one, which is the one that we're talking about right now, they had some new video games to, for sale, and as recently as, like, seven, eight years ago, I went there, and they still had brand-new shrink-wrapped Japanese PlayStation 1 games, but, but they were, like, really base-level ones, and they were still selling them for the original, like, 1998 price. And so it would be, like, Rock, Rockman Dash, $90. Um, it was just wild stuff. I don't know if those are still there, but that was there was a whole plaza, but then specifically in the Mitsuo Marketplace, it was all indoors, and so you could go into the it was like an indoor tiny shopping mall one floor and you could go into the market and buy your groceries and stuff but then all of the restaurant kiosks they're still there they're like inside of this space and they all have little like japanese style roof awnings and cute little signs and stuff and it just it felt like you were really felt like you were in another place in, in a way. And then later on, they had an anime store. 
I remember you found like some Oscar 120 percent wall scroll. I don't remember if you bought it. Uh, I did, yeah, and I still have that wall scrolls. Nice. Yeah, all those Oscar things that I've gotten, uh, wall scrolls and posters. Ooh, yeah, those things I'm not getting rid of. Yeah, it's uh, it was just a neat, weird time, and I feel like, you know, driving around here together, I remember these things. Oh yeah, you you're uh, supposed to exit. Yeah. Let's see how we. Well, you can you can do it illegally. We did it. We illegally merged everyone, and we're 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 exiting. It's all happening. So, but yeah, driving around together in this area really calls to mind those times, twenty something years ago, when you could just Japanese video games. You could just buy them in LA, and like also at Video Japan, they would rent CDs, and if something wasn't selling, they would then. Into the discount bin. They put it in the discount bin if it wasn't getting rented. And so I bought like all these Ai Nagase or Nanase, I forget what her last name is. Um, I think it's Nanase. Rock albums. And I thought they were okay, but they were, it, I got them because they were like five bucks each and that was cheap and they were available. And then when I went to Japan for the first time, she was playing on the radio of the, or like on the this little. I guess it was it was like a little crappy little radio at the ex- incredibly tre- cheap Ryokan where I was staying, and uh, I was like, "Oh, I know who that is," and and that's from this album, right? And and people were like, "How, how do you know that?" I'm like, "Well, I bought it from Video Japan." They're like, "What is this, <laughs> what is this mysterious person?" Yeah, it was uh, it was just an, a neat time, and you still see some remnants of that, like our experience just now at Book Off. Um, the Gardena Book Off, which is still the good one, and Bunkado, which we went to earlier, and all the CDs and tapes upstairs. There's still, like, Little Tokyo and Torrance. There's still a significant Japanese population that lives in Los Angeles, and it still does to some extent. Like, Little Tokyo is more for Western anime fans at this point, but it's all staffed by Japanese people still. Yeah. Uh, Actually, when we were at the Bunkado, I realized that uh, two of the people that were working the counter there, I actually knew them from when I would regularly shop at my local camera store, which was Kimura Photo Mart, which was a a Japanese camera shop owned by the Kimura family. It, It was actually really cool just seeing those guys over there. Oh, that, yeah, you've been here just living and, and working your whole life for the last two decades that I've been in this area. That's that's kind of cool. Yeah, it was... I don't think we said this yet, but we had a, a little funny moment in, in Bunkado where we were trying to look at some Laserdisc box sets that were um, behind a case, so we had to ask somebody, and the lady came up to help us. And we were, and we were like, oh, yeah, it's this, or, you know, it's that thing. And she's, she was like, how do you know these? <laughs> and I was like, well, because we're old. <laughs> and she's like, I'm old too. But I also do appreciate in a place like that when like someone starts speaking Japanese and then you start speaking Japanese back to them. And in the U.S., especially in L.A., when someone starts speaking Japanese and you speak Japanese back to them as a clearly non-native speaker, they don't care <laughs> they're not like, oh my god, you can speak this language. They just are like, all right, now we're speaking this language. <laughs> it's totally, it's totally fine. I I appreciate that. Yeah. So we're now on our way to Veggie Paradise. We're gonna eat some good vegetarian food with our friends. Who we are about forty five minutes late to meet because we stayed in Book Off too long and did all of our awesome podcast content. I'll take pictures of the things that we got so that um, you all can see them on the internet later. We've generated a lot of content here. You got any other things to say about early Los Angeles? Because actually you've you've continued to live here since then. I, mo- I moved back to the Bay Area, of course, but I only lived here for those four golden years, and then you stayed in school for about five, six million years after that uh, because you uh, got like about 800 majors and then but I I I left and I would continually return for like E3 and I you know I come here two three times a year but uh, you've you've 
continue to be here and watch how things change. Do you have any thoughts about it? It is nice when you see the line be uh, like this continuous unbroken line. Like that book off at Gardena, that thing is great because it's not that it's the same book off that it was 20 years ago, but you can see that that ethos yeah. behind it has survived that two plus decades that I've known it. Um, and there are so many places where, oh, because of the change in the culture, the ca the change in the population, like, okay, we're going to tear this down and put this new thing in. Even with the book off, all these new book offs that are coming out, it's all different. You know, they're either chasing the, the Japanese pop thing or the anime thing, or, well, yeah, we're going to make a, a straight up, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like a nice goodwill in some places. Yeah, it's, it's, different. it's all, um, in quotes, Cool Japan, which was that initiative that they had where they were like, these are the things that people like about Japan and we're going to push them. And it, and it was like, we be anime, 50 girls in one band, pop music. And I don't think that that's really what's cool. <laughs> I mean, I'm an old guy and maybe that's different for the youths. But I feel like something like Book Off, that's more cool Japan because it's actually taking care of its history a little bit. It's not just chasing... The new, like, the, the new stuff is there, but also the old stuff is there. Like, where else in the United States, except for maybe the book off in Honolulu, could you go and in person browse and find two art-slash-guidebooks about a PC-88 series? That, like, that kind of stuff, it just, you'd have to buy it on the internet. That's, but if you can go in and look and thumb through stuff and be like oh wow this thing is here that's to me it's a valuable experience and it's cool that that remains uh to some extent even as demographics change yeah i i, I wonder if there's sort of an in-between of functions of the retail shop and the museum that stuff like Book Off actually serves a real purpose there. Um, I think in America, you do have these other types of museums. Uh, I'm thinking about things like uh, the Museum of Jurassic Technology, where they, it's kind of funny, but they, they sort of look at the old way of thinking about things. And by old, I mean things that are perhaps a few decades in the past, how science worked and how people actually did medicine 50 years back versus now, you know, the idea that uh, it wasn't that long ago that having uh, the thing where you just jumble up your brains, like that was a normal medical procedure less than a century ago. And so there are, there are places like that where we think about what it is that we do in order to engage with human society. But there's also all the stuff that we deal with, like so much media consumption is there and that's actually a big factor in how we look at the rest of the world too it's really really interesting to see how something like that rumble roses art book for example the idea of what cheesecake is back 20 years ago versus what cheesecake is now and those through lines and those bumps in the road of pop culture history that's really cool to me yeah you know i kind of wish that I had bought that Rumble Roses book because it, it was such a such a time capsule. Like they, they basically they pose all the wrestler ladies in erotic poses or whatever. They're PS two models or three three sixty models. Yeah, and and but it was they were like so proud of the technology that they were able to model these ladies' butts and boobs or whatever. Which is you know, it's it's obviously lecherous, but it's also historically significant in certain ways. Um, it's it's just it's interesting to think about it from that perspective because like there's a lot of old stuff and a lot of new stuff in the book off, and, but it's kind of like a a museum where you could buy things. It's a living museum in that way because they also get more stock in from Japan or they get more things that people trade in, and so it's true that some of these new book offs. You know, they're just staffed by American teens making off-color jokes, which which is what the Echo Tech was about, which is not really, not really the vibe. But you go into Book Off, and people are saying "irashaimase" and um, "no, sorry, that point card doesn't work here." 
I wish my <laughs> Japanese book off point card worked there because I would have gotten a lot of points because I uh, got too many art books. But yeah, it's it does feel like it has some kind of a, a function for the, at least for the the mind of the curator to be able to go through and get inspired by things. And even if, even if I didn't buy that Rumble Rose's art book, which I didn't, it made me think about stuff. It made me consider how, uh, like our relationship with cheesecake, our relationship with technology in video games, what kinds of things were pushing technology and, in some cases, it was like, like you look at Dead or Alive, uh, and it's it's bounce physics that were important. I don't know. Uh, also, we have to get over to the, oh, I, we can go to seven ten from here. Okay, it's just like that 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 only to five was confused. Was I, and I do think you might have to get over one. Yeah, uh, I didn't want to put that in the podcast, but we do have to. <laughs> we do have to get over. <laughs> it's all right. It's, it's live TV, folks. Uh, as as they might say, but yeah, uh, man, that Museum of Jurassic Technology is really cool because it it takes the ideas of what people did believe in, say, the early 1900s, and expands upon that as though making speculative science about that. Like, what if we still, what if that was what we believed, and and we time capsulize that, and most of the stuff in there. It's not, none of it's true history. It's all speculative history rooted in that time. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm always talking about with making video games. Like, you don't make the game slavishly designed to be retro. Like, you don't want to make an NES NES game. You want to make something that feels like people remember it. And that's what, like, Shovel Knight does. People are like, oh, it's exactly like an NES game. But, of course, you could never do that stuff on an NES, uh, the things that they do there. And the game design is all modern, but it gives people that feeling and that window and that kind of bridge in between those two spaces. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of some neat stuff. And now I'm regretting not buying the stupid Run to Rumble Roses art <laughs> <laughs> but it's it you know it's also an embarrassing object to carry back to your to your home. Yeah, you want the TSA to do a random check on you. But they might be like, "Oh man, I love Rumble Rose." <laughs> I mean, it's the TSA. They're probably going to love it. Uh so anyway, TSA more like T and A. More like T and A and with that we leave you for now. Bye forever. So that's it. I'm leaving. All of my press goals were pretty much shattered, except for the one that I did with Giant Bomb. But I've realized, I decided in the middle of it that like, if my actual reason for coming wasn't going to happen, if all of that was gonna fall by the wayside, I would at least have some good hangouts, hang out with my friends, go to some places I used to go, have a good time, and at the very least I accomplished that. So, you know, we're out a bunch of money. It was a waste, but I got to have fun. I got to see my buddies, got to go to book offs. Uh, last night I hung out at my friend's place while he and some other guy were DJing for literally nobody, just for themselves, and playing like a, a Moog through a bunch of distortion pedals and stuff along with them to just have a goofy time driving Vince's Miata through the Los Angeles freeways at 12 in the evening, midnight as they call it, some places. <laughs> Pretty fun. We went to Veggie Paradise today, got some good food. I don't know, you gotta, gotta find the sil silver lining on these things, I guess. So that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye forever.
Insert Credit Show is a production of Insert Credit. This episode featured Brandon Sheffield and Vincent Diamante. Original music by Kurt Feldman. I'm your editor, Esper Quinn. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye forever. Oh, wow.